very warm welcome to this uh, to this webinar. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending on where you are connecting from. Uh, we are pleased to welcome you to this um, BOSS High Impact Common Services webinar on physical accessibility. Um, this is a joint initiative of um, DCO and the Executive Office of the Secretary General Disability Inclusion Team. Uh, and as part of a series uh, on disability inclusive business operations. My name is Brianna Harrison. I'm the disability inclusion focal point in DCO and it's really great um, to be with you today. Before we begin um, and introduce our speakers and the agenda, um, I'll just mention a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, to be as inclusive as possible, I'm going to provide a brief visual description of myself. I'm uh, uh, a female with red hair. I'm sitting in an internal office here in New York uh, wearing a black shirt. Um, just to note as well that this event adheres to the code of conduct to prevent harassment, including sexual harassment at UN system events. Um, and we're very pleased um, to be offering um, accessibility features in this webinar. We have CART transcription services, which you can turn on and off through the platform. Um, and we also have sign language interpretation and welcome to our uh, interpreters. Please feel free to ask any questions you might have um, uh, in the, the Q&A box for our team um, to answer and then share with everyone. Um, colleagues and support team here will be monitoring the, the chat box and following up um, after the webinar too with any additional um, questions or documents um, that may be requested. At the end of the session, you'll also be able to unmute um, your mic and raise your hand and participate in the discussion. Um, and we are recording this webinar so that we can also share it with other colleagues who are able to be here with us today. So as I mentioned, this is part of a series of, um, of uh, webinars on disability inclusive uh, business operations. It will be complemented by um, follow-up webinars on inclusive HR and accessible um, ICT services. Um, and even though these can be watched independently, um, they are also part of a, you know, a broader initiative um, that DCO and the EOSG have been um, supporting um, around um, providing you with more information and support on disability inclusive um, operations, particularly at, um, at the country level. So this webinar will cover physical accessibility, um, its importance and key considerations to conduct assessments of physical accessibility and um, in having in-person events. Um, I'd like to just introduce today's speakers and the support team. Uh, we have Gopal Mitra, Senior Social Affairs Officer uh, from the Disability Inclusion Team in the Executive Office of the Secretary General. We have Anna Berlieva, Program Officer on Children with Disabilities at UNICEF. Uh, we have Kara Elizabeth Yarkhan, um, Disability Advocate and Communications Specialist and also former uh, UN staffer and Afki Botsman, uh, the team leader for the um, resident coordinator's office in Indonesia. Uh, we also have Luis Diego Cobb, who many of you may know already uh, from the business operations strategy team here in DCO. And also part of our support team, we have uh, Georgia Dominic, social affairs officer in the disability inclusion team in the executive office of the secretary general. And um, I know a Frameson special assistant to the resident coordinator in Nepal, who has also been uh, working with the team here in DCO New York um, in the last couple of months. Uh, so um, I think we have a slide that shows the agenda, uh, which I will just, uh, just share with you quickly. So we have the um, introduction. Um, um, Luis Diego will then give a brief overview of the BOSS and the high impact services and how this fits within that. Um, Gopal will then um, sort of provide a bit of context in terms of the UN disability inclusion strategy and the UN country team accountability scorecard. Um, and we'll then hear from our experts, um, uh, Anna on physical accessibility, 
um, some field experience uh, from, from AFK in Indonesia, um, the personal experience from, from Kara, um, uh, and then we'll open for, for Q&A. So uh, we're really looking forward to this um, and we look forward to receiving your, your questions um, and discussion during the, the Q&A session. Thanks so much. And I'm going to pass over the floor now to Luis Diego. Hi, good afternoon, colleagues. Good morning, wherever you're joining from. Glad to be here connected again in this webinar for physical accessibility. Um, as Brianna mentioned, it's part of a broader series of webinars on disability inclusion. Um, we will have other webinars coming up on inclusive HR, ICT accessibility. So please stay tuned for that as well. And as you know, this is part of the um, disability inclusion and high impact common services services that we have identified to have a high impact, not only in cost avoidance, quality improvement, but also in driving SDG impact. And disability inclusion is a core component of that. Um, we believe that operations can, can lead um, by example. It can not, not only create a change within UN premises and operations, but also ask as a act as a catalytic um, change agent for other organizations as well, both private and public. So we'll give a, a very brief overview. The main thing we wanna emphasize is um, that there are many resources available. Um, you don't have to become a disability specialist to implement physical accessibility or the other streams of disability inclusion, um, but you have a robust team behind you um, supporting and available to connect you with all the different resources that are there. Um, as you know, just a brief overview of the high impact services, um, as I mentioned, Disability inclusion is a core component of that. Um, we also have the gender inclusive services as well as the environmental um, sustainability services there. Um, today, we'll, we'll focus on physical accessibility and the ability to be able to track and to identify the advances that you have done in disability inclusion through the business operation strategy. It's a great way for us to be able to have an overview of where you're at in the country offices what support you need, what gaps and barriers you're facing. Um, so we really want to encourage you to not only um, take the, the initiatives to create physical accessibility, but also to be able to, to track it within the business operations on the online platform. We realize that um, the annual review is only going to open at the beginning of the year, next year in January of 2023. However, you can start working on the working plan um, in adopting many of these initiatives. Um, the main initiative that um, we are sort of um, incorporating with the disability inclusion, physical accessibility uh, services is for the premises to, to achieve level one accessibility. And you will see that in a second, and Anna will speak a bit more about that. There are levels, accessibility levels um, that units have established. Um, we are working already with 16 pilot countries to create a proof of concept. And here are a few of, of the countries um, that we're working with. Um, we welcome to work with um, many more. So please feel free to reach out if you are um, wanting to increase the accessibility of, of your premises, want more resources. Um, again, um, just um, we'll put our contacts in the, in the chat box and we'll share the resources that we have um, in a follow-up email as well. Um, just very quickly, the physical accessibility of, of level one, which is sort of the, the baseline that we want um, country offices to aim for, is the ability for um, a person with a disability, whether they're working or they're visiting the premise, to be able to, to access from the parking and the entrance of the building, to be able to circulate to the meeting rooms, workstations, and bathrooms, and having these interconnected, even though physical accessibility is one of the most straightforward as far as um, things that you need to kind of look after. Um, we emphasize consulting organizations of persons with disabilities as much as you can. Disability is very diverse. And again, we hear stories of um, country offices wanting and having the will willingness and the funds to create accessible bathrooms or whatnot, but overseeing um, small things like a small step coming into the bathroom that makes the whole modification inaccessible for somebody using a wheelchair or so forth. Um, and I think this, this is part of what we want to talk to today and what we want to continue working with you to, to iterate to create those levels of accessibility and the best practices or better practices as we grow along this journey. 
Um, that's all I wanted to share today. Just again, emphasize that we're here to support you. Um, you have the business operation strategy also to help you track that progress. Doesn't matter if you haven't reached the level one accessibility, if you're working towards it, and if it's registered on your boss, um, work plan, annual plan, um, it's there and we'll be able to, to also, as, as I said, track it and be able to follow up better. So with that, I'd like to hand over to colleague Gopal Mitra from the Executive Office of the Secretary General, who will give us an overview of the ANDES and the accountability scorecard. Over to you, Gopal. Enter news currently on uh, thank you, Luis Diego. Uh, thank you, Brianna and uh, colleagues. It's wonderful uh, to be um, um, on this uh, uh, webinar today and to have a conversation on, on accessibility, in particular physical accessibility. Uh, just before I go to uh, the, uh, give you, uh, before I give you an overview of the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, let me just step back and just in uh, third, one minute, um, just uh, outline when we talk about persons with disabilities, who are persons with disabilities? Because in all webinars, we, we have this question from colleagues. Um, according to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, sensory, psychosocial, or intellectual impairments, which in interaction with the barriers prevent their part, full participation in the society. So when we are talking about persons with disabilities, we are talking about all persons with disabilities in their full diversity. Persons who are uh, who have physical disabilities, persons who are blind, those who have intellectual, psychosocial disabilities, and so on. But here, what, when we try to understand what is disability, we should understand it is the interaction between the impairment and the barriers that exist. And when we talk about disability inclusion, our aim is to then focus on how we do not create new barriers and address existing barriers. And it's important, particularly in today's discussion, because accessibility is one of the key means through which we can not create barriers, but on the other hand, create an enabling environments for persons with disabilities. So having said that, uh, the Secretary General launched the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy in June 2019 to bring about lasting and transformative change on the, uh, in the work of the UN on inclusion of persons with disabilities. Because we found that the UN was doing work on, persons with, on inclusion of persons with disabilities, but it was not systematic, it was not enough and much more needed to be done uh, 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 for the UN to live up to its charter and to its mandate and also the international goals, for example, like the, like the SDGs. 15% of the population or 1 billion people with disabilities are there in the world. And if you are not able to include persons with disabilities, it is but natural that we'll not be able to achieve any of the SDGs or any of our international goals uh, that we have signed up to um, uh, uh, as a global community and uh, as national government. Uh, so the, in terms of the strategy, it contains an, a policy and an accountability framework. The accountability framework is where the teeth of the strategy lies. It has two components, an entity accountability framework and a UN country team scorecard, which both these components of the accountability framework has concrete indicators. I'll show you, I'll give you a flavor of how these indicators look and, uh, uh, and with concrete benchmarks. Uh, the, the UN disability inclusion strategy is aligned with other corporate strategies like the strategy on gender, on youth and so on. Just to give you a flavor of, of how what the indicators of the UN Disability Strategies Country Team Scorecard contain. Luis Diego, do we have the slide? Yes, okay. we do. Yes. So if you see on the slide, and I will uh, uh, also uh, uh, take you through it, uh, there are 14 indicators. The Country Team Scorecard of the strategy contains 14 indicators clustered under four core areas leadership, strategic planning and management, 
There are indicators on how committed the country team leadership is towards disability inclusion and whether it's championing it or not. Uh, whether our strategic plans, uh, the cooperation frameworks uh, uh, are uh, addressing disability inclusion or not. There is a core area on, on inclusiveness, which, which addresses uh, issues, critical issues like consulting organizations of persons with disabilities on accessibility, which is the, uh, an indicator on accessibility, which is the focus of today's discussion on procurement and so on. There is a cluster on uh, uh, programming, where there, is, uh, there are uh, uh, indicators on uh, joint programs, how disability inclusive our joint programs are, uh, on, on humanitarian action, whether it's disability inclusive or not, and so on. The fourth cluster is organizational culture on uh, indicators on, on employment of persons with disabilities, uh, how disability inclusive our communications are, and so on. So today's discussion, focuses on physical accessibility. Um, and as Luis Diego mentioned, the series will cover other, uh, other related aspects. Now, when we talk about physical accessibility, the, as I just said, uh, the scorecard can, uh, com, uh, has a specific indicator on disability, on accessibility, which includes both physical and digital accessibility. And uh, when we talk about accessibility, it is also interrelated or connected to several other indicators. For example, on, uh, uh, on the issue of reasonable accommodation, which is also part of the, of the uh, uh, accessibility indicator. And we'll discuss about it more when we talk about uh, inclusive HR services and so on. There is an indicator on procurement. If you have to promote accessibility, our procurement also needs uh, to factor in or, or include uh, components of accessibility and use an accessibility lens. When we talk about employment, which is indicator 12, uh, uh, we, are, we talk about uh, employment of persons with disabilities. If we are not, if our premises are not accessible, uh, we will not be able to uh, have more persons with disabilities as part of our workforce. And among, within all this, one, fundamental issue is consulting persons with disabilities and their representative organization. Whether uh, we are trying to promote accessibility, whether we are trying to uh, uh, develop our cooperation framework, uh, whether we are trying to make our humanitarian action more inclusive, persons with disabilities have to be at the center of it. Not only because it is the right thing to do, but also it's the smart thing to do since persons with disabilities have the first-hand experience and knowledge of how to overcome many of the barriers that we are trying to address. I'll stop there, and uh, uh, we can go into the uh, into the discussion, specific discussion on accessibility, and we'll be happy to respond to any questions that you may have at a later stage. Thank you so much, and back to you, Luis Diego. Thank you so much, Gopal. That gives a, a lot of context mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of framework um, for the disability inclusion beyond physical accessibility. Um, now I'd like to hand over to Anna Bulayeva, who is a disability specialist from UNICEF, um, who will walk us through the work that they've done and how that can support other entities and country offices. Anna, over to you. Thank you so much, Luis Diego, and uh, welcome colleagues. I'm so impressed with the numbers, 85 people. Thank you so much for staying with us and joining this webinar. I uh, know how uh, valuable your time is. Um, so we've been almost 20 minutes since the beginning, so I want to uh engage you a little bit so i would like to start with a um, simple poll so in my presentation i will cover gapal was sharing uh commitments on undis luis Diego gave a framework and i will talk a little bit about what the key components of physical accessibility are and also um i will cover i will touch upon uh, some key resources and where what can we start today where we can start so the question to all of you would be um in your of is your office um, accessible? So you can answer yes, fully accessible, somewhat accessible, uh, somewhat inaccessible, inaccessible at all, or not sure. There is no wrong answer. So you have maybe one minute. So we've heard from about 60% of the participants. I'll give a few more seconds and I'll share the results. Thank you for being attentive. So 
So one last call if you want to answer the question, give us an overview of where you're at. We have about 70% respondents. You can just click on the screen. One of the options, and I'll go ahead and, and close the poll and then share the results. Excellent. Uh, so we have majority responded uh, somewhat accessible. Uh, very few not sure. A few inaccessible at all. Uh, somewhat inaccessible, about 12%, and fully accessible, 18 So the, the two uh, sort of uh, the, the biggest uh, portion, uh, somewhat accessible, and some fully accessible. This is excellent. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your knowledge on this. So in the presentation, maybe I can ask Luis Diego to um, go to the slides, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I will start with, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on talking about why. We already know why um, the CRPD is currently ratified in 185 countries. And uh, uh, the, the key principle in Article 3 is has accessibility uh, as a, a necessity, as a main principle for uh, inclusion in society. And there are many related articles, specific Article 9 and indication 20 and 19. Uh, on independent living and theory also on access to uh, cultural life. So uh, we know this framework. Um, then also in 2016, um, there was a, a third, third UN habitat. And uh, in this habitat, um, all the ministers as well as uh, many mayors, so local sort of uh, governments, they met and they agreed on the um, new urban uh, agenda. So this new urban agenda, one of the key principles is uh, inclusion and accessibility. So this is sort of our uh, big commitments. And uh, the other thing is a, a technical a technical sort of a key document, right? Some countries are saying, oh, we don't really have our open uh, commitments, our open technical um, resources. Uh, there are standards. For example, there are the international ISO standards, um, 21542. Uh, and I will share with you more uh, UNICEF resources that recently came out that also based on the standards. Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the key considerations um, for physical accessibility. And I'm sharing the image from uh, our colleagues, um, Humanity for Inclusion, former Handicap International. So on the image, um, you will see the concept of uh, RECU, R-E-C-U, reach, enter, circulate, and use. And you will see there is a, a bus that is accessible with the ramp. There's also a ramp lead to the entrance of the building. There are several rooms and you will see there are some people using sign language. There are some people uh, without disabilities, other uh, members of this group using a wheelchair. And there are different elements um, of accessibility. So the concept of RECU is a uh, unbroken chain of movement. And for us, this is something that we're taking for granted, right? How do we get to work? How we enter our office? But in reality, um, if we look at majority of the public buildings um, around the world, they're not really accessible. So from uh, starting from the reach, uh, we need to think about uh, accessible roads and transportation. For example, if we talk about school settings, it's not only enough uh, to have accessible entrance to the school, right? But if the uh, road is not paved, it's very muddy, it will be difficult for a child, for example, who is blind or for a child who is using a wheelchair to even enter the school. Um, do we have accessible um, vehicles also? Um, that's another um, question. Do we have a, a dedicated accessible parking uh, spot in the premises? So that would be to reach. Then when we enter in the building, let's think about, um, let's think about what are the main components. It will be, uh, door, right? The width of the door. Do we have a minimum or not? It's in some settings, it's 850 millimeters. In some standards, we're using 900 millimeters to make sure that a wheelchair can get in. Uh, then or once we enter, what else? Like in many UN premises, we have this sort of security, uh, uh, security um, uh, sort of roller. You can put your bags on. In some cases, those, those gates not very accessible and they are narrow, narrower than the standards. Or sometimes you cannot go around those uh, gates, for example. So then, okay, now we already entered and the next is circulate. So let's make sure we can circulate uh, vertically, if we can go to second floor or the third floor, as well as horizontally. Um, 
So that's what we talk about circulation. We talk about pathways, about the corridors, making sure they are not too narrow. We're talking about um, ideally uh, some um, science and tactile uh, for those who are blind. Um, and the next would be use, of course. Do we have a restroom that are accessible or not? Do we have offices that are adjusted? So if, for example, if we have a colleague uh, who have a, a visual impairment, for example, let's ensure that our offices are minimized with the obstacles around, right? And talk to these colleagues what would be the best. The same if we have someone who is a wheelchair user, let's make sure that we, the, the door frame is wide enough and we can adjust our furniture. Uh, luckily, in most of the UN offices around the world, we can now adjust the height of the furniture. So those are just a small few things. So keep in mind this uh, REQ, reach, uh, enter, circulate and use. Another concept that Luis Diogo already mentioned in the comments is universal design that uh, became known in, to, in uh, um, 1860, I believe. So it is about uh, how do we make sure that in any, anything we do, either we, uh, adapt pro either we develop products or facilities or environment, or we are being accessible and thinking of everyone. Either there is a mother who is using the stroller, a pregnant woman, uh, someone a wheelchair user. So the concept is really applicable to all. Some of the key principles of design is uh, simplicity and uh, intuitive use. And you may see it in the main technologies nowadays, for example, in the smartphones, right? It is accessible for everyone uh, and we don't require specific adjustments. So this is the one limit principle of design. Um, I want to kind of give you some heads up also, and when, once you, uh, you know, go back to your offices also to think, and also just look in your environment, you might start noticing, and I'm currently in one of the countries in Eastern Europe, and there are uh, so many, there are many pitfalls. So one thing is uh, to build something accessible, but another thing to build something inclusive and accessible according to the standards with involvement of persons with disabilities and building it together. Um, I've seen nowadays many ramps that don't have uh, handrails. I often seen, just yesterday, I've seen the uh, uh, traffic light that has a sound for those who are blind, but when you press the button, it doesn't work because it's malfunction or not being uh, maintained, and it's often happened. So when we talk about um, accessibility, we really need to think about standards, about maintenance, you know, about really thinking it as a key concept uh, for inclusion in anything we do. So we can go to the next slide, please. I have about four minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, where do we start? Um, as simple as we can start with, the, um, I would say it's a assessment, right? We don't wanna call this audit, uh, it's accessibility assessment. It could be done even in our offices um, by assembling accessibility task team in many offices, uh, some offices I know it's already existing. In some offices you have a disability uh, a working group. So see who will be interested to engage. Uh, engaging persons with disabilities in this assessment and uh, uh, mapping uh, several steps. In my next slide, I will show you uh, some of the resources that you can use. We recently developed accessibility toolkit, for example, that has a checklist, 17 checklists. Literally, you can take this checklist and together with people with disabilities, different disabilities group, of course, thinking, um, can we reach the building? Can we enter the building? Can we circulate and use? Um, also, um, think about uh, local policies as well as terms of use of our facilities. Is our uh, UN building is a long lease or short lease? Are we all the building or not? So all this has to be taken into consideration. Um, in some cases, we are more limited than in, other, in others, but there is always a way, at least to start with the simple. As Luis Diego already highlighted, there are uh, different accessibility levels. So we can start with level one and move further. Um, then I will show you uh, quickly the resource that I was mentioning, accessibility toolkit in the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so this is just one of the resources and the many out there. So accessibility toolkit um, of UNICEF focusing, give the kind of glimpse um, for everyone on what do we mean by accessibility and physical accessibility. Well, when you work in uh, programs, when we talk about UN promises, when we uh, making our access assessment, the whole chapter on how to do the assessment. Uh, we also talk about uh, different events. How do you make events accessible? And of course, give a lot of um, uh, useful tools, very simple tools. How do you hire a consultant 
uh, an architect with an accessibility and knowledge. So we give the sample of TOR and so on and so forth. And again, one thing I want to highlight also uh, when we talk about resources and we talk about accessibility work, um, it does not cost much. And there are some estimates that say it will be about uh, one to 3% of the budget when you include accessibility in the design stage, of course, with more expensive, more, more expensive than retrofit. So definitely when we advocate for accessibility and I encourage you all to use um, advocacy for accessibility section, so the funding should never be an issue because really it's very minor. It should be a set up at the beginning because as Kapal mentioned, if we don't make our physical environment accessible, we are creating barriers. So I almost have no time. So my next uh, uh, little intervention will be about events. And uh, maybe on this, I will ask um, all of you to answer the question um, in the poll. Uh, Liz Duga, can I please ask you to launch the poll? If you know that your office have done any accessible event. Okay. Yes. Uh, so has your, often, uh, has your office held an accessible in-person event? Uh, the answers could be yes, no, or not sure. So you already captured some of the um, ideas of accessibility. So it's about uh, accessible venue, um, restrooms, entrances. So let me know if you have thought of it. We have about 75% respondents. Thank you. We'll give a second or two more. We can click the answer of the poll on your screen. Then end the poll, about 82% of respondents. So I'll go ahead and close it and share in the interest of time. Okay. Uh, I think the answers are more or less aligned. So uh, majority not sure, and it's kind of more or less divided, yes and no. So we have more people that uh, are aware of uh, having accessible events. Wonderful, 37% yes, 24 no, and 39 not sure. Thank you for sharing. Great, great to know that you have done some accessible events. So I have about 30 seconds and I don't wanna take time from uh, this discussion. So I'll just touch base on the three main components is a, one is of course the events now held in person and digital and you can find more information, many resources and Luis Diego will also ensure we'll share with you some resources. But the most important is, first step is registration. Really think what is the demand? And uh, we cannot assume that everyone needs sign language right or some specific sign language that we would like to offer so we need to um, ask registration form about reasonable accommodation and give some examples and be, be ready to provide it um, of course thinking about physical platform so either it's uh, um, online or, or in person so for in person uh, venue uh, consider having volunteers um, transportation as well also, some people with disabilities prefer to travel with a, a chaperone, a personal care assistant. So please make sure to include it in the budget. Um, a few things would be also to uh, having a sign language and real-time captioning available. Of course, consult with the um, uh, local deaf community about which sign language should be used uh, in this context. Um, and uh, about uh, different re resources, right? Resources could be available in print, electronic, and other formats. And very quickly about virtual, I don't wanna go uh, far into it, but yes, also about platform that we're choosing, accessible or not, um, in UNICEF as minimum, uh, every virtual event has a uh, real-time captioning, and we worked with uh, Microsoft Teams, and we worked with Zoom to ensure we have this in our license. So as a minimum, um, facilitators who is skill skillful, as well as a PowerPoint presentations has to be accessible. So I'll stop here. And uh, happy to answer any questions, either it's uh, in this uh, webinar or offline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And that provides, again, another great overview and resources available. So from the technical side, we're going to be moving into the field. I'd like to give the floor over to Apke Bootsman, who is the strategic leader and resident coordinator's office team leader, um, about the work that they've been doing there, um, some of the good good, better practices they have done, and lessons learned. So over to you, Aki. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to share my screen. 
which I think means the other presentation needs to, it says you cannot start screen sharing while the other okay. part is sharing. Give me a second. Sharing. Ah, yes. We should be able to. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, just need to find the right place. Yes. I hope it's working now. Okay. Um, please confirm if you can see the screen well. Yes, we can see it. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So good uh, good day, everyone. My name is Afke Butsman. I'm the team leader for the RC office in Indonesia. And uh, I will say a few words about our journey uh, to try to make our uh, UN premises more inclusive and accessible. Um, I should say that um, our main UN uh, premise, whereby about 13 UN agencies are located, is a commercial high-rise building. So um, just wanted to give you that background because it's different, at least from many of my previous experiences where we had, let's say, like full autonomy over our um, uh, UN premises on um, what we could do, uh, etc. So it was an interesting uh, uh, experience. I want to say uh, to share with you our experience um, on how we went about our uh, assessment and while reflecting about it. Um, uh, we speak of physical accessibility, but I like actually. Uh, what uh, Gopal mentioned on the scorecards, perhaps it's better to speak about building um, and or um, premise accessibility, because what we learned is that the physical accessibility um, it comes also, there's a component to train frontline workers, like people who are not on UN um, uh, staff uh, contracts, especially in commercial buildings, like um, uh, cleaners, uh, security personnel, and the receptionist of the actual building. Um, and that's all part of uh, making the premises uh, accessible. This is, this is one of the things that came to mind. We still call it physical accessibility, but I think we're going to change the terminology. So what we uh, did is um, we, we did an actual assessment um, uh, in, in the month of uh, March. So um, we started, um, we have established a small group with a few agencies and I'm very happy to see here my colleague from UNDP, um, Ibu Bulan, uh, joining us uh, today as well. So we had a representative of uh, UNDP, WHO, uh, ILO, and then the, um, the RC office and uh, representatives from the OMT through the common services. And we recruited a, an organization um, that is known for uh, working in this field of uh, uh, making um, offices more accessible for people with a disability. And together with them, we developed a checklist um, that we used as a baseline. And the checklist um, was also reviewed by uh, experts um, or like people who live with, with, an ex um, uh, with, with a disability. Um, one on sight and hearing, physical, mental, intellectual disabilities, uh, neurodivergent. So we have tried to be quite um, uh, inclusive in, um, um, in, in uh, yeah, to basically make sure that the checklist that was developed um, represents the various possible types of, of disabilities, recognizing that each individual um, has its own individual needs. Then in March, we had, let's say, a walkthrough uh, by five, those uh, five individuals together with um, uh, this small group of, of UN colleagues. Um, and they used the, the checklist um, as the base for the assessment. And um, throughout, we uh, interviewed uh, them um, also to document the entire experience. Um, so we hope by the end of the year or early next year to have all our disability inclusion work um, come together into one documented output. So also ICT, HR, as well as th this, uh, this building uh, assessment. Um, and to get, let's say, first uh, response on, on their experience. 
Um, we also looked into like the local regulations of the government um, on the Ministry of Public Works and other technical guidelines for facilities um, that were uh, specific for Indonesia um, as, as, uh, to incorporate that as well. Um, and um, as I said, we were working, we are working in a commercial high rise. So we also need to take into account what we can and what we cannot uh, amend. So those are the 10 areas um, that we assessed. Um, I mean, the entrance, elevators, um, the UN floors. We, have, we, are, we are located on different floors. We have like one nucleus and then some agencies are on different floors, restroom, stairs, emergency exits, parking lot, the canteen, the basement and the uh, public transportation just in front of the building and how accessible it is if you come um, with public transport. So I have quite some slides and I don't want to go in detail through all of them because that would take too much time. Um, but just want to highlight uh, a few that, that really um, uh, struck our um, uh, yeah, attention, if I can say so. This is for example, on the, um, on the entrance. While we thought we had good ramps and as you see, the ramps are available but the feedback that we received in the report is that the, um, um, the angle of the ramp was actually too steep for um, uh, the, the wheelchair user to use. So this is something, for example, we had no idea that that was, so we thought, oh, we, we, we can take off, we have the ramp, but actually it was too steep and which made it a kind of dangerous. So we are looking into that. Um, here is in the elevator. Uh, we had some uh, control uh, um, uh, panels with uh, sound, but others like don't have the the braille marking. So this is also something that um, that we are uh, looking into. Um, here is when you reach the UN floor um, with security, for example. Um, how um, how uh, can people with a disability? access um, the, um, uh, the security because we have security downstairs and then we have again security at the UN uh, floors. So it's actually twice. And uh, there were quite some learnings um, here as well. We learned, for example, here, it was not so easy for the reception officers to give clear instructions um, on yeah, how to access the, the premises, the offices um, uh, to people, for example, who are blind. Um, here are some very specific uh, dimensions for meeting rooms. Our meeting room doors, for example, are way too heavy. Um, they are not sliding. Um, and also like the handles uh, were not on the right um, height, uh, which can uh, pose a danger. So what we are currently doing, we, are, uh, we have three meeting rooms on one particular floor. We are replacing all those meeting door rooms with sliding doors. So that is currently um, happening. And what is um, very interesting to see is that we see agencies that are currently rehabilitating their own offices also taking that into account. Because we, we had, like, when I speak for myself, I had no idea, for example, that the sliding door is preferred. Now we are aware of it and we advise other agencies when they start a re um, rehabilitation to actually uh, use sliding doors. So this, this work is going to start uh, next week. This is a major um, um, uh, amendment to, to the structure. Um, this is something on corridors, um, something quite simple, but uh, we actually learned there's quite a lot of litter in the corridors, like empty boxes, uh, printers not well positioned. So those are easy things that can be uh, changed uh, without any cost, but which makes already the offices much more um, accessible. Uh, the toilets, this is for us not an easy one because the toilets are, are really, let's say in, in this sense, in our building, in, in a way uh, built that is quite structural, but we are looking what we can amend within the space that we, that we have. Uh, for example, we cannot make off the toilets bigger because that is, that is simply not possible, uh, but there are some elements that we can do. Here is something on the stairs. Uh, we learned that um, it's better to have extended handrails. So as you see, we already made those amendments and they were in um, um, just last week, the 15th of August, 
were um, uh, finalized. It's a small thing, but again, something that we never thought of if we would not have been uh, told. Um, this is on the emergency exits. We have, um, because we're on different floors and the building is 26 floors in total, um, not all UN floors have this um, um, uh, yeah, device to, to transport people who have a, a, a mobility um, a, a challenge in times of a, of a crisis. So we, are, we have to, this is something we are still reflecting on. How do we go about it? How do we train the floor wardens? They are aware, but not all floors have this device. So this is something that, yeah, we are still looking into those emergency structures. Indeed, if, do we have to buy more of them? Um, etc. Uh, here in the parking lots, we had two. Um, it was very nicely, you know, with like a, a stamp that they are parking, uh, that they are um, uh, available for people with a disability. But when the assessment was done, we learned that they were too too tight. So we now have converted three spots into two. So where you see the white car. Uh, that has now been uh, merged into two spots. And on the right bottom corner, uh, we already now have two actual um, parking spaces for people with a disability that are marked and that are actually can be used and that have enough space. Um, here in the basement, this is very specific. This is again with, with ramps. Um, this ramp was uh, on the good angle, so that, that one we don't have to do much. We also have a canteen, which is open also for the public. Um, well, just um, we also learned like for public transportation. So maybe a few final words that I want to share in terms of um, uh, our experience. As I already mentioned, it's not only on the physical, it's also on the frontline workers. So as part of this process, we did this training for um, uh, the frontline workers who again are not UN staff or personnel, but with whom we work with like security personnel, cleaners, receptionists, and uh, together with uh, people with a disability, this training was held. And um, we already did, we got some feedback that people who come into the building and who have a disability, we gave us feedback that they are very well received. So yeah, we start to see that the efforts are giving a positive uh, feedback. With the consultancy company, we looked into Okay, we have now a list of recommendations and we uh, categorize them by which ones can agencies do just themselves, like cleaning the uh, corridors with the litter, a better positioning of the, the printers. What can they do by themselves? What can the UN do? And what can the building management do? So we spent quite some time and Ibo um, Bulan, who is here with us today, also together with our OMT is meeting regularly with the building management to see what do they want to take on in terms of cost um, and an effort to make our um, office more, more accessible, which means that whole building becomes more accessible. Um, so we try to basically take them with us in this, in this journey. And uh, so far they have been quite open. Um, I mean, much more can and should be done, but if I see what we have done in the past six months, I'm very hopeful for the next, um, uh, six months. And then with the money that we have received from, from DCO, we have been looking into low cost, high impact projects, the ones I shared with you. And um, I also um, shared with you um, some, let's say, more medium cost and um, or like a high impact, but with a more investment. And this is really thanks for the budget that we was made available by DCO, like the um, um like the meeting rooms um so that is really very much appreciated and since it's used by UN staff and by visitors it is we consider this a high impact so thank you yeah. very much for sharing thank our you thank you Askin. phenomenal to see and we'll be sharing the slides we know you've done so much progress and there's so much to show um we are a bit tight on time so Kara, um I would like to hand over to you to share your personal experience um, and then hopefully have a few minutes for um, Q&A at the end. So over to you. This is Kara speaking. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Buenos dias. Salam alaikum. Konnichiwa. Ni hao. Bom dia. 
I am delighted to be with you all here and tell you a little bit about my story. I joined the UN system 22 years ago at WFP Ecuador, but my journey with disability began 15 years ago when I just joined UNICEF Angola in 2007. And over the next five years, I went on to another five country offices. And as my physical impairment um, progressed, I had to come to a place where I decided that I was going to disclose. And part of me, I am a South Asian woman with long black hair, green eyes, wearing a satin blouse, sitting in front of a lot of fancy decorations in my apartment. When I went to Haiti, one year after the devastating earthquake in 2010, the UN offices were still located on different UN bases. So I think it's important when we talk about premises, we're not only thinking of country offices, um, programmatic spaces, but we're thinking about humanitarian settings and field offices as well. Lo the UN log base or logistical base was located at the end of the tarmac of the airport in Port-au-Prince, which is the capital city of Haiti. And the staff at the time that I went had upgraded from tents to working out of shipping containers. When I was hired, we were very lucky in UNICEF that their unit, uh, Rose Angela Beeman Berler, our global lead of disability, was on board. And there was a protection policy to protect the rights and reasonable accommodations of staff with disabilities. There was a lot of protest, however, especially from operations and security, always asking the question, but how will she manage? And luckily, that question was asked to me being told what the situation was, what the terrain was like, what might be some of the accommodations that I would need. At the time, I was only using two canes and two leg braces. I had yet to upgrade to the fantastic power wheelchair that I sit in today. But even with that, we had to take into consideration that my workspace, the shipping container, was flat on the ground, that it didn't have even one large concrete step, let alone three or four, to get into my workspace. At the time, we also used external portable toilets, the porta toilets, which had a wooden staircase going up to them. My colleagues with their wonderful intentions, their definition of a grab bar back in 2011 was a towel rack. And they printed out the accessible image of the wheelchair, universal accessibility, and put it on the door so that I would know which one of those two porta toilets had the grab bar. And while that wasn't sufficient, and while that isn't to spec, it's not something that any of you would be doing now, I want to acknowledge the positive intention of people not knowing exactly what to do, in some places not having sophisticated and comprehensive checklists like what you have now at your fingertips and really trying to do the best that they can. Really importantly, we had very candid conversations and open dialogue as to what would work for me and what wouldn't. I felt safe in my environment to say, you know what? During hurricane season, I'm not going to make it over the rough terrain to the portable toilets. And one of my colleagues was assigned to helping me navigate that difficult space so that I could just go and have my private time in the bathroom with dignity. Our meeting office room was actually under a tent. And even then on a windy day, as it is often windy on the tropical islands, someone would help carry my papers so that I could just concentrate on getting ready for my presentation. There was a very unique conversation that was brought to my attention about a year into my time with Haiti. And I just asked to like you to think about what I'm about to say with a little bit of open-mindedness and grace, because I receive it as, again, well-intentioned. As mentioned, it was brought to my attention that there was a conversation with the head of security and the head of operations. And all 36 local drivers were asked anonymously, this was before I arrived, if they would be comfortable being in the same vehicle with someone with a disability. 36 of the drivers, only three said yes. Now, the taboo and stigma around disability in Haiti, as in so many countries in the world, including my birthplace, India, and even here where I live now in the United States, it's, it's pretty high, it's severe. 
And we cannot ignore the beliefs around people with disabilities. And many of these people believe, not knowing me, that I might be contagious, that I might have been, this was some curse that was set upon me by some wrongdoing in the past. And so while rather than scoffing at that or being hurt by it, I looked at it as, wow, they made the effort to ensure that not only did their drivers feel comfortable, but that I was safe to ensure to put me with someone that would provide me with the additional assistance that was needed. I'm lucky to say that at the end of my two years in Haiti, all 36 drivers wanted to drive with me in the car. I'm great fun. You have a dead little dance, put on some music as you're going to your workstation. It's about having that human contact. It, it reinforces the importance of having people with disabilities work in our offices. But just because you have someone with a disability present in your office, as already has been mentioned here, it's not a one size fits all solution. Secondly, we can do a lot of training among our staff as we need to, international and national staff. But three, we have to take into consideration the outside culture that is still going to have an impact on our engagement. I mentioned those first three drivers that are assigned to me. And the one who I spent the most time with his name was Ricardo. Ricardo was young, 25, loved to talk to me about all of his girlfriends. We had become good friends. And I felt safe with him, which was very important in a rough terrain like Haiti. We were going to a meeting one day, he was dropping me off at an event. And so he stopped the UNICEF vehicle at the entrance where there were two security guards carrying very large weapons. The situation was tense. The guards were yelling at him saying, you can't stop the car here. It's not safe. Move up the hill. Ricardo, wanting to ensure that I was safe, he whispered to the guards, but she's sick. Please let her out here. And I calmly said to Ricardo, Ricardo, you don't have to say I'm sick. You can tell them I have a disability. And in that moment, Ricardo's eyes swelled with tears. And he said to me, Cara, please make me say that word. I realized in that moment that this friend, this colleague who was committed to keeping me safe and making sure that I could do my job with dignity was still struggling with some of the cultural taboos and realized that in that situation to use such language would have put me in danger. So what that is to say to you is, is that we will have a sort of cultural immersion Physical accessibility and checklists, of course, are important, but please and take into consideration the human interaction factor, the cultural factor, because those are certain things that we can't always just check off with a box. I know we're short for time and we want to leave an uh, open session for questions and answers, but thank you for being with me here today and thank you for your dedication to ensuring that all UN personnel with disabilities, whatever they may be, are included, safe, and feel like they belong. Thank you. Thank you, Car, for those wonderful stories, for transporting us to, to your experience in Haiti and, and beyond. Um, I'd like to take a minute before we open up the floor to introduce Heba Kelif. Heba is a disability specialist. Um, she's based in Cairo, and she's going to be supporting um, DCO and supporting country offices to implement um, disability inclusion and operations. Heba, if you have a chance to unmute yourself and say hello and give a brief introduction, well, we open up the floor if you'd like to raise um, your hand to ask a question directly. We've been answering um, some of the chat comments and questions, um, and we'll also follow up with the resources. So Heba, if you'd like to unmute the floor, is yours. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Louis, for giving me this Professor opportunity Bain, to uh, introduce myself to everyone. My name is Heba Khalib. I'm based in Egypt, uh, Alexandria, actually. Um, and I, I, I have a, a visual disability myself. I'm a screen reader user. I'm very passionate about uh, digital accessibility. And I'm very happy to be with you here today to uh, listen and hear about different experiences in uh, physical accessibility as well, because this is one of my uh, interests as well. And uh, I'm very happy to be starting my work uh, with the DCO. And I hope that uh, I could contribute um, to more and more, uh, achieving more and more accessibility to, to, to different uh, UN premises all over the globe. And uh, uh, I've been uh, working um, in the field of disability since uh, 2001. 
uh, up till now. So I'm very glad to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Great to have you and, and great to be reaching out to the country teams that are already reached out and that would like support on ICT accessibility. I don't see any hands raised. I know we're uh, short of time. Gopal, if you'd like to say any final remarks um, before we close off and just again emphasize that we'll be reaching out and we're available um, for any support that you may need in physical accessibility, ICT, HR, or any other indicators within the, the scorecard as well. So over to you, Gopal, for any final remarks. Uh, thank you so much, Luis Diego and colleagues. Uh, thank you for being with us today. As uh, we have seen throughout uh, today's conversation that uh, it, is, it is a journey, right? And uh, uh, there are so many interconnected factors uh, in terms of removing barriers, whether it's the, in the physical realm, whether it's the digital realm, um, a lot of it is to do with lack of awareness uh, uh, and uh, the existing stigma and so on. All these are connected and we, we start addressing them. Okay, at the UN, what we see is we are starting from a low base, say out of 10, uh, five years, 10 years back, as Kara was mentioning, we were at one. Now maybe we are at 2.5 or three. We can't jump to 10 overnight, but we can, with all of your support and engagement, as Afke has just mentioned, we can go from three to four to five at a pace uh, which, which, which is meaningful and which is realistic and which can make uh, the, the lives of our colleagues uh, uh, in the UN better and to be able to contribute better and to ensure that we have more and more colleagues with disabilities. So thank you for being with us, uh, uh, our colleagues in DCO and at USG, we work closely. We are there to provide any support that we can. And we look forward to your engagement and to engaging with you. And thanks to our sign language interpreter and uh, to the captioning colleague who's providing the captioning and to all the wonderful uh, panelists, Anna, Afke, Kara, uh, thank you so, so much. And thanks to all of you for giving your time. We know how valuable it is and how tight pressed you all are. So thank you so much. Over to you, Luis Diego. Thank you so much, Gopal. I had put in the screen also the upcoming webinar next week with Inclusive HR. So again, also thank the speakers, interpreters, um, captioning um, colleagues as well. And we look forward to seeing you and to staying connected to, to continue driving um, disability inclusion in your country offices. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.